Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so to help our audience get to know you a little bit better, I'm going to start with a brief introduction, if that's okay. So Amanda White is a therapist and founder of Therapy for Women. She's based in Philadelphia and helps women under the age of 35 with substance abuse disorders, depression, anxiety, and trauma. She helps them break free from negative patterns and find freedom. Um, Amanda has also created an Instagram community with almost 300,000 followers through which she supports and inspires women with mental health advice and tips. I'm personally really excited to have her here today because I think she's one of the prominent online voices helping to destigmatize and start the conversation around mental health. Now, Amanda, you've struggled with addiction and mental health challenges before. How have your own experiences shaped and inspired the journey that you're on helping others? And I really don't think that I would be where I am or doing what I'm doing if it weren't for that experience. You know, mm -hmm. I struggled with seeing, you know, I struggled with my mental health growing up. Um, I struggled with an addiction and I saw a lot of therapists who I didn't connect with and who I didn't like. And I kind of had some negative experiences with therapists. So I feel like that really, you know, I finally found a really great therapist, um, you know, in my, when I was like 21 and she really changed my life. And I kind of promised myself that if I was able to figure things out and I was able to get well, that I would spend my life, you know, doing the same for others. And I felt like I know what a good therapist is and I know what a not so good therapist is. So I feel hopeful that, you know, I can be a good therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at which point did you decide in your journey that um, you can start to take charge of your mental health? What was the tipping point for you? Yeah, I think that's a really great question because I think looking back, you can kind of see things differently than when you're going through it yourself and you're experiencing it. I always had wanted to get well, you know, hence why I was like in therapy and I always had the idea of, I hoped that things would just get better. I hoped that if I just went to therapy, someone else would kind of fix me or do it for me. So I think for a long time, I was just not an active participant in the healing process. I was just attending and doing things, but not actually putting in the work. And it wasn't until um, I really had a moment of when I was working with, you know, that therapist that I said really helped me where I really realized, you know, I had actually at that point started um, applying to go to grad school and stuff like that. And I was struggling with not doing that well. Um, with my mental health. And I realized that if I didn't start to kind of get it together, I didn't feel like I would able, be able to do this and become a therapist. So that was a really big motivation for me. Um, and I think just like, you know, I felt very lost when I graduated college. I felt very, you know, I went to, I started applying to grad school because I, I was so afraid to get a job, to be honest. So I think I had a moment of kind of just realizing that this can't continue. I can't keep going down this path. And that mm. was a little bit of a wake up call for me. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so did that, um, how did that lead to um, where you are now and um, therapy for women, um, the development yeah. of that? Yeah. So, you know, um, part of becoming a therapist, not only do you go to grad school, but you spend a few years um, under supervision, it's called. So um, after I graduated um, from my program, I spent a few years working at an addiction rehab facility. And I loved my time there. I had great experience, but I was also really frustrated with how few modern approaches there kind of were to therapy. Mm -hmm. Like there was a lot of, especially I worked at a drug and alcohol rehab and I saw women really struggling with trauma and with eating disorders. And no one really talked about the overlap of all of those things. They were kept really separate. 
And that was something I personally also experienced when I was on my healing journey of there wasn't a lot of talk about how the different types of mental health issues can overlap and intersect. And um, after I got my license, I wanted to have a private practice where I could be honest about being in recovery in the same way that that therapist who helped me, she was honest. And that was one of the reasons I went to her was I lied to almost all my therapists before that, because I felt like they were going to judge me. So I know kind of firsthand how, when you find a therapist who's like authentic, at least this was my experience, it really helped me be authentic and vulnerable too. And that made such a big difference Mm. in you know, my healing journey. So, um, yeah, I, I decided to be honest on my website and then I created the Instagram from there. Um, and a lot of people told me like not to be that honest because, (laughs) you know, it's not advisable and blah, 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 but I've always kind of been of the mindset that I'm not for everyone. And, you know, my practice is definitely not for everyone, but I think that there is this new really important movement of therapists being more authentic and being honest about that they're not perfect and they're not, you know, these people on pedestals who have everything figured out. And I think that can make a big difference in people feeling comfortable seeking therapy. So Mm -hmm. all the therapists that work uh, at Therapy for Women have been to therapy before. And um, a lot of them also specialize in the actual things that they worked through themselves. Mm, okay. Um, well, it's surprising to hear that so many women are actually getting misdiagnosed or things are getting missed because um, I would imagine that would be really scary in the process because you think you're getting help, so to speak. Um, but actually, it, I could see how that would lead you to feel more afraid, if anything, because it's not helping. The help isn't helping. Um, why do you think that happens? Why do you think um, misdiagnosis or that crossover of symptoms um, can help, um, I guess, um, means that um, so many people are getting um, missed in the process? Yeah. I mean, I think it's hard with addiction specifically or an eating mm-hmm. disorder because when you're in that process of using a substance, you're it's hard to know what your baseline is, is what the term is in therapy. Like it's hard to know what are your actual mental health symptoms Mm -hmm. versus what is being caused by, you know, those substances or the withdrawal from the substances or your eating disorder or the symptoms that go along with your eating disorder. So I don't think that is necessarily specific to women because I think that, um, you know, anyone who has multiple different things going on at the same time, has that overlap for sure. Mm. But I do think that it's more common with, um, especially women with addiction tend to have a really high rate of having like, having a high rate of PTSD or sexual assault that's happened. I mean, if you think about, I mean, the statistics say one out of four women have been sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. You think about the overlap of, I mean, and that's even higher with someone with addiction. You think about um, the statistics say 15 to 45% of um, people with substance use disorders also have an eating disorder in some capacity. So all of the symptoms kind of overlap and can reinforce each other. And it's hard to kind of figure out until someone gets some recovery or some time, what's actually, you know, them versus what mm-hmm. is just a symptom of the trauma, the addiction, the eating disorder, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and so why is it important um, to, to treat people as a whole, like, as opposed to just their symptoms? Um, why is that important for, for your patients or your, or your clients, I should say? Yeah. I mean, I think it's extremely important because I think if you think about anyone, you know, we're not just a collection of symptoms. We're not mm. just racing thoughts or, you know, struggle, like struggling to sleep or low mood or, you know, anxiety or any of those types of things. There's a bigger story and a reason why we might struggle 
with those things. And the reason why can help also with um, like treatment and how we change something, you know, someone, Mm -hmm. I'll give the example of someone who comes in and tells me they have insomnia. There could be a whole different list of reasons of why they may have insomnia. And if you just treat them as someone who struggles to sleep and you just give them kind of the basic, this is what to do to work on your sleep, you could be missing a bigger picture. Like anxiety can cause insomnia. People can get scared and anxious about falling asleep, which can Mm. cause insomnia. But if you just think that that person has insomnia and you don't get to the bottom of what their pattern with sleep has been or what other things they're struggling with, or maybe they're a mom and part of their insomnia is like caused by their kids being up in the middle of the night or being anxious and worried about their child, or maybe they've had trauma with their child. Maybe their child has like been sick or something. All of those things are going to influence that diagnosis and is going to really influence which way you go and how you treat that person. And you're going to miss all that context if you don't Mm -hmm. understand um, the person as a whole and why they do what they do. Yeah, totally. And I would see how that might make, um, that might add to that stigma of going to therapy. Um, You know, there there must be something wrong with you or this, you got to go in to get this thing fixed, as opposed to thinking about that complex interplay of like things that are going on and how we respond as humans and it's it's such a it's so much more complex than that and um i wouldn't imagine it would help people to take that on as their identity if they're yeah take take on that diagnosis as their identity so um that's yeah. really great that's refreshing yeah and i think to your point too it's like one thing that i really believe and stress is that there's a reason not just there's a reason why we do something but like most of our behavior in some capacity served us for a while, right? Like whether you struggle with people pleasing, whether you struggle with addiction, whether you struggle with procrastination, whatever your thing is, it probably like served you in some capacity. And I think helping people understand that there's not something wrong with them, they're not broken, they just may have been engaging in something that did work and doesn't work anymore, right? Or if you think about mm. our childhood, a lot of us survived and coped with life in a certain way. Like I said, whether it's being a people pleaser, whether it's you know shutting down and being quiet, it's like if you can understand that your behavior was, you did it to protect yourself, to survive, it can help with that self-compassion a lot too, rather than getting mad at yourself and thinking that there's something wrong. Mm. Yeah. Um, and why do you, um, why do you think, um, why, um, or how do you find that you yourself being authentic and um, bringing that to your work is helpful to yeah. your clients? Well, I think it's important, you know, obviously I don't talk about myself at length. So yeah, obviously. I'm, so actually it's I, funny. I, I had that same experience. <laughs> yeah, some people think that's what that is, which it's not. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you don't, but yeah. Um, so I think that, yeah, like just having the context of, right. I think you can say different things to different people and different people trust you when they know what you've been through and that, and they, think that you understand maybe what they've been through. So I think that Mm. helps. I think that I can form a deeper relationship sometimes with my clients if they know that I'm not sharing something with them or giving them, you know, feedback based on me reading this in a book necessarily. And it's more from a place of like, I know what you're going through. Um, so I think it helps. I think the biggest thing that it does is it helps other people feel like they can be vulnerable and honest with me. And one of the most important things that I wish people knew is statistically the most important factor that determines whether your therapy will be successful is that relationship you have with your therapist. Hmm. That's number one predictor. So if you don't like your therapist, if you don't feel comfortable with them, if you don't feel like you can be honest with them, go find a new therapist because it's really, really unlikely that therapy is going to work for you in that case. Hmm. That's a really interesting point, actually. Very interesting stat um, because, um, gosh, it's it's not all about 
the years you've spent in college or how many books you've read, hey, so that relatability. Um, so what advice do you have then for people to, to find a therapist that is right for them and not going through that process that unfortunately sounds like you went through? Yeah. I mean, I think it's hard. Like, I think it takes time and I think it can be a little like dating sometimes, which sucks of like, you might have to try a couple different therapists before you find someone who's the right fit. Um, I mean, my recommendation also would be in terms of what I did is I didn't trust myself to find a different therapist. If I didn't like the person, I just Hmm. kept going and thought that it would just work, you know? And I think that that's a really important thing. Like Um, so I think whether you have to find a few different therapists and try them, I think asking friends or family for recommendations sometimes can be helpful. Um, but it's also why I'm on social media, because I think that, um, you know, even though like a lot of people who find me on social media, don't see me personally, it's like, if you find someone that you jive with and you trust their vision or their approach, you know, if you find a group practice, for example, that has other therapists that are part of that group approach, you can then maybe find a good fit there Mm -hmm. too. So I would really tell people, write down a list of qualities that you want your therapist to have. I mean, there's nothing wrong with We all want different things for different reasons. You can want your therapist to be the same age as you. You can want them to be older than you. You can want them to be the same or a different gender than you. You can want them to be the same race as you. You can want them Mm. to be a mom because you're a mom, or maybe you don't want that because you don't want their opinion. You know, I think you can want your therapist to be similar or different. So I would write down a few non-negotiables like like some of those characteristics I gave, but also, you know, finding someone who specializes in what you're dealing with. And um, you can do phone, like a lot of therapists do free phone consultations. So you can meet, you know, you can chat with them over the phone for 15 minutes and see if it's a good fit. And if it's not, don't book and and keep looking. (laughs) Yeah, it really does sound like speed dating or Tinder or whatever it is, oh gosh. (laughs) Um, I was also going to say that sounds like a expensive process as well, which might be disheartening to some, but um, it's good to know that there is that option to have that conversation for um, 15 minutes or so. Is there a a screening, a a list of screening questions you would recommend? I actually Um, have stuff like that on my Instagram and I have a free guide on my website. Um, But some of the things I can recommend saying like, some questions I think you can ask are like, do you have experience treating what I, you know, what I'm dealing with? You can ask them if they've been to therapy before. You can ask them, you know, how will we measure progress? How will we know if, you know, we're measuring progress? You can ask them, can I say if something isn't working for me? Things like that, I think can be really important in understanding if you'll connect with the person um, and be able to be honest with them. Yeah. Um, So going back to to your Instagram and website and just your whole process, which is um, what I really want to talk about today. Um, So you mostly um, like to work with younger women, um, 35 and under, um, and I mean, obviously everybody's mental health challenges are all unique and all very important. Um, but for you, what do you think is um, the, um, I guess, significance of um, this point in, in women's lives? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I kind of specialize in millennials and that's, I feel like that age range has slightly changed as, as I've gotten older <laughs> with millennials. <laughs> like that it's it's funny now there's obviously like the new generation of gen z and stuff um but i really love the the time period in which women i feel like are discovering themselves that kind of college post college early adulthood um is really my favorite i think because i struggled so much during that time and i changed so much during that time and i really love um, working with people, um, who are interested in change and, um, you know, younger folks tend to be able to have more opportunity to change than someone who is more at the end of their life. Or, you know, once Mm -hmm. you get married and have kids, 
it's a little harder to sometimes have big changes, though that's definitely <laughs> still possible. Um, so yeah, I think it comes from that personal experience of I struggled so much at that age. I think it's also just really formative age of figuring out who you are, what you want, what your values are. And I think it's, um, it's kind of an exciting time too to be able to discover yourself and create the life you want. Yeah, but also you you explained so many things going on at once. So I can see, you know, how that would be confusing and sometimes overwhelming. Um, if you add to that, you know, trauma and yeah. and stresses and things like that, it would just make it even even more so overwhelming. Absolutely. Um, yeah, dating, job, mental health, you know, friends, transitioning, moving out of your yeah. parents' house. It's a lot sometimes. scrambling to get it all the job the the date the oh yeah I know <laughs> that part <laughs> I know I don't so, <laughs> yeah we all have those years where you're like oh my god I yes. I can't believe I got through that and um I, yeah I wish I had a therapist to tell me what I should have done better um um I was um what was I going to ask you next? Oh, yeah. So I really love your Instagram account. Personally, yeah. I've been following you for a long time now. And um, we've been following you. The Happiness Planner have been following you as well. Um, and one of the things that I really love is how you so, um, you're so vocal about that need to destigmatize um just that talking about therapy, talking, yeah. going to therapy, there seems to be this, this fear almost if you have got something going on that you feel like you need to talk to somebody that there might be something wrong with you or people might think there's something wrong with you if you do go to therapy. Um, but also it's, it's just not something that particularly millennials or anyone really talks about it openly. Um, yeah. In, in any kind of conversation, be it with your parents, um, partners, or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. And so I think that personally, I find that very inspiring um, and really important. Um, I guess from your point of view, why do you think adding to that culture of uh, and normalizing that, um, why do you think that is important for a person who might be struggling with something or considering asking somebody for help but not sure what does that do for our culture in general yeah yeah I mean I think it is so important because I think for so long and if you look at one thing that I like to to remind people of is if you think about the counseling field or therapy in general has only really been around since like the 1930s which is not mm. very long if you think about it, right? Generationally, especially, right? Um, there's only been a few generations that have even been able to go to therapy. So if you think about, especially, you know, your grandparents, you know, the um, Great Depression area, era, at least in like the United States and stuff like, stuff like that, I think that it was not, it was just not even talked about because you're just trying to survive. And then the generation after that, it was like, well, you aren't going through this really hard thing. So you should be happy. You should be great. Everything should be wonderful. So I think that um, generationally, we haven't even known how to talk about this. There's so mm. much stigma just baked into mental health because asylums used to exist. I mean, people used to literally, if someone wasn't well, they would be mm. locked up and there wasn't thought to be anything that we could do to help someone. Mm. So I think if we orient ourselves with the history, that can be helpful sometimes of how far we've come, because I think we have come very far with people being more open, especially younger generations are being more open with social media and things like that. But I think it's a scary thing. It's, it's still something that seems like a weakness. There's still a huge difference in how people talk about mental health versus physical health because people um, are able to kind of say, if you break your ankle, if you have, you know, cancer, if you have, you know, a chronic illness, it's not your fault. But because our minds are more complicated and we have some control over all of this, it can still, the culture still kind of acts like it's, you have a lot more responsibility. And if you just thought positive thoughts and, you know, got up early in the morning and ate more vegetables and exercised every day that you would be fine. And that's 
not the case. People's brains are different. We're wired differently. And, um, you know, mental health is health. So I think that's a really important conversation. And the more we can talk about it, be open about that. I think everyone can benefit from therapy. It's not just for people who are broken. Um, the better that it, it can be. But the other hard part about it that I think can kind of reinforce stigma too is right now it's based in just like insurance too. So you have to have like an, like a mental health diagnosis to technically get insurance reimbursement and things like that. So that can be a barrier for people feeling like, you know, I'm not sick enough to go to therapy or get a therapist or whatever. Mm. And I mean, what was your process like when you um, were were going through your challenges, um, your process from um, figuring out, should I speak to somebody? Should I seek that help to where you are now, just being so open and um, and just authentic with, with everything that, that you've been through yourself? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely not open about seeing a therapist when I was younger. Um, I, I mean, I was 15 when I first started seeing a therapist. So it was, you know, a process of like my parents helping me find a therapist and that same process when I found a different one, when I went to college and things like that. Um, so I think like one thing parents can do is like, if your child comes to you and tells you that they want to see a therapist, please be supportive. Please take them. Please don't you know, make it about yourself. That's one thing that's sad. That's mm. hard is sometimes parents will be like, what did I do wrong? And it's, it's not about what the parent did. It's just about that, you know, that kid is, is struggling. Um, so I think that's, that was one thing that I navigated with. Um, I didn't talk about it openly because I thought that people would think I was weird if I was in therapy or something like that. Um, so I was very secretive about it until I started getting better. And I think until I thought that I could see myself uh, ending therapy at some point, maybe, I don't think I was really able to talk about it. But the other thing that really helped me too was I was in group therapy mm -hmm. where you're with other people that are struggling with what you're struggling with. Mm -hmm. And that was really helpful for me in kind of breaking down some of the stigma because I met friends and people that I connected with who were also struggling with similar things. And um also obviously in therapy. So that helped me in the process of, I think, becoming more open. And, um, you know, as a therapist, I think that it's much easier, obviously, to talk about therapy because <laughs> it's a huge part of my life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so in then finding that balance of um, being open and authentic and just like owning what you're going through and adding to that conversation that, um, in the bigger picture will make everybody feel more comfortable in having that conversation and then makes you feel more comfortable talking about it because you're not going to be judged. Exactly. How do we, how do we find the balance of talking about that, being authentic about that, um, but also protecting ourselves and not sharing too much that um, too much too soon that could hurt us in the long run? That's such a great and really important question because I think the Right. I think social media is so awesome with people sharing more, but I think people also can overshare sometimes or share more than they actually feel comfortable with and can, you know, it can then hurt them, like you were saying. So, um, you know, Brene Brown, who kind of is like the queen of vulnerability and stuff like that, has a really good way of talking about the difference between vulnerability and she uses the word is called floodlighting. Floodlighting is the term where someone tries to be vulnerable by sharing a lot, but it's not actually vulnerable because it's like a floodlight where you're trying to share, like the light is kind of sharing, but it's so bright and intense that it actually kind of keeps people away because it's so bright. And if you think about the people that kind of do really long monologues sharing about every negative thing that's happening in their life, that would be what I would say is not vulnerable because vulnerability mm. also has boundaries. So vulnerability also is about someone earns the right kind of to learn about you. So 
while it's awesome to be open and if you feel comfortable, I mean, I'm obviously very open about it because I'm advocating for therapy, but individuals mm -hmm. I think who are struggling, I don't think necessarily need to share it with everyone, but sharing it with people who you trust, who you know won't make fun of you, who you know, um, you know, will support you, um, who've earned the right to know certain things about yourself is kind of the best thing. And I think that goes, whether it's talking about therapy, whether it's talking about trauma, whether it's talking about, you know, anything that you're struggling with, um, you want to make sure that, um, not everyone, you know, that the people you share it with, that you trust them and that, um, they're actually like, you know, good supportive people in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that, that sounds like a really important part. And it's, I guess, how do you, how do you um, figure out who those people are? Um, because that's the danger. Um, sometimes, um, you know, you could start, um, I know that I myself, um, I've had friends growing up who have struggled with anxiety and there are certain, those telltale signs that um, they might withdraw, they might not come out, start to come out anymore as much as um, they used to, or they just, they're not available to, to talk and hang out as much as they used to be. So sometimes people can pick up on those cues and I guess how, um, how do you, like, what advice would you have for people to sort of be like, look, I've got something going on. I don't want to talk too much about it, but, um, but, you know, like let them know so they don't, you don't damage your relationships yeah. with people, but also not share um, when, you know, I'm sure there'd be a ton of people. I myself was one of those yeah. um, who was eager to give all this advice that is unfounded and you're not an expert, but it's well intended, but could end up hurting the person more and making them feel more isolated or that something's wrong with them. Yeah, so, I think that's a really good question. I think number one, I think if you're that person struggling and you want to share with someone, you can also say, I want to share this with you, but I'm like not looking for advice. Like I'm just looking mm -hmm. for support. I think that's a really important thing that you can say because a lot of times if we feel uncomfortable with something, like we feel, we feel awkward if someone's upset or really anxious or struggling and we put pressure on ourselves to make them feel better. But mm -hmm. really what they probably need is support, not necessarily our advice. So a boundary I would recommend someone who's struggling set is, hey, I'm not looking for feedback. I'm not looking for advice. I'm just, you know, I just want to share this with you, for example. Mm -hmm. I think also in terms of how do you know who to trust? I mean, I think trust is built in the, a lot of times trust is built in small moments. It's built in when someone does something that they say they're going to do. It's mm -hmm. built in when someone, um, you know, shows up for you consistently, or even if their life is crazy, if they, you know, if they say they're going to call you or come to this event, they communicate if they can and they're, they're, you know, they keep you in the loop. I think it's whether you've told them things before and they've reacted positively and supportively to you in the past, that can be a helpful measure of if they're going to react, hopefully positively and supportively to you in the future. And knowing that if that changes, you can change your boundaries, right? Like if someone has always been supportive, but maybe they haven't been, or they said something that you didn't like, and you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to share that with them um, necessarily. And then I think the other thing you asked me was in terms of, um, I'm trying to remember exactly. We were talking about this conversation of with um, other people and how do you know what to share and not to share and stuff like that. The other thing that I recommend too is if you're someone who's sharing, you know, like, I mean, I'll, I'll answer for myself. When I share on social media or in a public context, um, Glennon Doyle, who is like an awesome author who I love, she talks about sharing from your scars, not from your wounds. And I think that is a really beautiful, helpful metaphor of even myself, when I'm sharing on social media or something like that, I'm not sharing from something that I'm actively dealing with right now. 
I'm sharing something that I've like worked through. And if someone says something negative to me about it, I'm not going to be as triggered because it's not like an open wound that I'm trying to figure out. Like it might still hurt, but it's, it's not going to mess up my healing process. So I think that might be a, a helpful metaphor too, for people of, if there are people that you want to be more open with, but you don't totally trust them. Maybe there are certain people that you share from those scars, not from something you're actively dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting metaphor. It took me yeah. a second to figure it out. I'm like, oh yeah, that's actually really yeah, wise. Like something that healed. Yeah. Yeah. And I've learned this from this, but you're, you're sharing that you've been through an experience. So exactly. you're making yourself vulnerable. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And then um, even someone, right. Like to go to your metaphor or to go back to what you were saying, right. About the difference between if you say, you know, someone gives you bad advice or advice that maybe hurts, if you're trying to figure it out and you're actively like, I don't know if I should go to therapy or I don't know if I should continue with my therapist or I don't know if this is trauma or whatever you're dealing with. And then someone says something like, oh, I don't think that's trauma or I don't think you should do that. You might take their advice versus mm -hmm. if you've already worked through that, someone giving you advice that maybe you don't take or you don't like isn't going to um, be as hurtful either. Because you'll yeah. be able to be like, no, nope, no, thanks. <laughs> um, another thing that tends to come up a lot of the times, um, I think that's a really big part of our culture as well um, for that sort of immediate looking for everything to be good or that think, you know, thinking positive thoughts all the time, um, which is, I mean, I get really frustrated. I can imagine as a therapist who understands our mind so well, how that's just not feasible. Um, yeah. But another big thing that um, seems to be out there a lot is people's tendency to say, oh no, I hope you get better or um, just, it'll, it'll be okay. Just think positive or just that, just that um, there's that sense of rush to help you get better um, yeah. when in reality that's not how it necessarily works like it might take us a while to to untangle everything that's been going on for us um, and sometimes we have to sit with those those really uncomfortable feelings right um, yeah. I mean I know just in in you know some of the co complex things that I've tried to work with in trying to understand different parts of myself and and whatnot um, it's just it's not um, realistic, but that that idea, that culture, um, that praises that um, feeling, you know, just get it out of the way, um, get it out of the way. You want to feel good as as soon as possible, or you poor thing that you're going through this. Um, what do you have to say about that? What are your thoughts? Yes, I get very frustrated <laughs> with that as well. <laughs> um, I think that you know the idea of toxic positivity is really it's really causes a lot of negativity, like it causes a lot of harm in mm. society. And a lot of it comes not from um, the person who's struggling, right? It comes from the person who wants to, like you said, that rush, they want to fix it. They just, it's not even about the person who's struggling. It becomes about the person that's witnessing the struggle and they feel uncomfortable. So they want that other person to get better. Obviously they may still care about them, but to me, it's really about, because of how quick our culture is, because of how much a lot of us are not taught as kids, how to sit with our feelings, how to process an emotion. I mean, I think a lot of our parents didn't ever model that for us. If you think about mm -hmm. normally, if a kid falls and scrapes their knee, the first thing the parents say is, Shh, don't cry, don't cry. That message kind of gets internalized of, I shouldn't cry. I shouldn't show my feelings. Um, you know, I should be happy all the time. I think our, our culture likes to act as though happiness should just be our baseline. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, happiness and joy is wonderful, but it's one aspect of our life. It's not the absence of pain. It is a, a separate distinct emotion. And if we are trying to aim and, and have the goal of being happy all the time, we are not going to be successful slash we will also have to stuff down a lot of other emotions that are important. 
mm. for us to sit with. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest like tip I kind of can recommend is especially when you're with other people, asking people, do you, you know, like trying not to give advice. I think trying not to take people's pain away. Sometimes people need to be in their feelings. They need to be in the pain that they're in. And um, uh, we need to increase our tolerance, I think, to being able to sit in those, sit and watch someone be upset, sit in the discomfort of letting someone be in pain without fixing it um, or trying to rush to, to change it. Mm. Um, great. Um, I think, yeah, that's a really good point that um, most of us weren't raised that way and at no fault of our parents, obviously, because um, as you said, psychology is something that's still so new that we're learning more and more about now and hopefully for the next generations we can start yeah. to pass on more and more of that wisdom that is the um, hope <laughs> yeah exactly exactly I hope so too because um it'd be nice to see you know our kids and the ones after that be a little bit more woke as they say yeah. <laughs> um yeah and I guess finally um with all of that in sitting with all the feelings and everything that comes up another thing that you you talk about um which I find really nice is just that self-acceptance mm -hmm. um of yourself with everything that comes up what um what tips um what advice would you have for for just people in general not necessarily just women um yeah. um to accept ourselves what does it truly look like to accept ourselves um whether or not we have got a mental health challenge that we're uh, working with or not um how how does it look like to in, accept ourselves completely yeah well I think that there is a big myth that if you accept yourself you're giving up and you're just like resigning um and I think that's a big barrier that prevents people from accepting themselves. I think we tend mm -hmm. to think in our culture that if we accept ourselves, if we're kind to ourselves, that we won't do anything or we won't change or we'll stop setting goals. And that's actually just not true. Like literally, according to the research, you are more likely to change. You're more likely to create a new habit or do something that you want to do if you're kind to yourself versus beating yourself up. Um, so I mean, for anyone that's struggling with that, that's kind of my number, one of my number one tips is it actually doesn't work. So you feeling like you're being mean to yourself is helping, but it's really doing the opposite. So even if you don't feel like you deserve to be kind to yourself, I would say, try to be kind to yourself because you want to change because being mean to yourself is doing the opposite because it's shaming yourself essentially. And then I think the other thing is, um, you know, practicing self-compassion, like you can tell yourself that the way you you're feeling makes sense. You can say, you know, I notice that I'm feeling anxious. That makes sense. The pandemic is, you know, coming to, you know, entering a new phase. It makes sense that I'm anxious about going out into the world again, for an example, seeing friends. It's okay. I can work through this, saying something like that um, to yourself, validating yourself can be really helpful. Talking to yourself like you would talk to a friend. Um, so I, I think it's a practice and I think that's important for people to recognize is it's not just that some people are better at accepting themselves than others. It's really about you practice how you talk to yourself and you practice, um, you know, like the self-talk then becomes real when you take action on that self-talk mm -hmm. yeah and some people might have had practice at it growing up because they oh. might have had that um environment or been taught to to be that way um whereas some of us might need to to apply that consciously exactly. now that we're exactly. we're grown-ups um amazing well thank you so much i've learned so much today um it was really nice to chat with you and i hope everybody will um get as much as i did out of it um yeah thank you very much and i hope you enjoy the rest of your um afternoon it's i think we're in the same time zone yeah 
um and yeah and hopefully we can we can um chat about something soon yeah thank you so much for having me bye have a great day bye